hidden away. Next morning, bright and early, we went to the temple at Karnak. Karnak was built around the winter solstice. We were there a couple weeks early, but you could see the sun will go right as it rises. It goes right through the whole middle of the temple. We'll walk through this temple and you can enjoy listening to John. Karnak is the temple of, or, of material creation itself, of organic creation. And this is, and this is formal, I don't think even the anthropologists would disagree with that. Two, there are two very special aspects, many things, two particular that, that, um, that, let's say, that, that support the theory that this is designed for that purpose. One is that it's the only temple that we know of that from beginning to end is in a state of perpetual creation. Every single pharaoh, I think from the Middle Kingdom on, the oldest known area here is Middle Kingdom, which is just beyond the sanctuary there. So every single pharaoh from Middle Kingdom on has left a cartouche somewhere or a building somewhere in here. So it's in a state of perpetual creation and it grows out from the center, not exactly in a spiral, but like the rings of an onion. And out and out and out, both east-west and north-south. And of course, much of it is totally ruinous, but some of it is limits and it's so huge you can't explore all of it. But everything is here right down to the Ptolemies. And so that's one indication. The other is here in the Hyperstyle Hall, where, remember, this is where the ball Hyperstyle Hall is where Horus is raised to manhood by Jesus in the, is, 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 is instructed in the temple until he reaches maturity. Then John showed us something that was truly amazing. Listen as we went over to an obelisk that was over on its side and John is just tapping the end. I mean, someone showed me this when I first started coming here, one of the guys. And then, and then I started putting two and two together and came up with what I think may well be the rationale for the obelisk in the first place. Do go with this rope, put your ear to it. Lucy Lamy had me find out what the measurements of all of the obelisks were and they were always some exact fraction of the latitude of that particular temple. So in other words, they are quite literally attuned to the temple itself. Now we know, again, no geologist would disagree with this, and we saw at CPAC actually, the guy who was actually able to measure these things, that the whole earth is a vibrating hole. There are, there are magnetic and all kinds of energies in the earth, and so and so, if you have these things, these things behave, and they're in pairs, quite literally as tuning forks. You can't hear the energies of the Earth, but you know that, I mean, you know that they're there scientifically, and you also know it's there, they're there experientially, because when you walk around, you go through the woods, or you go through a beautiful city, or something like that, you get a sense this, that this place is special. I mean, we're here in Karnak Temple. It feels different than being in the, even the nice hotel. These things are actually, literally amplifying whatever those divine energies are. And so the, the sense of, of being in one of these temples, New Kingdom temples, would be considerably, if subliminally, enhanced. I mean, you wouldn't hear the earth energies, but it, these things would be pulsating like that. Everywhere we went in Egypt, we experienced the f simple fact that these weren't some dumb primitives who happened to get lucky by building these amazing temples, these incredibly precise buildings and complexes. They had mathematics, they had the Fibonacci numbers, they had pi, they had a level of communication supreme. They had the pyramids. Everything was built with an engineering mastery and precision that we cannot duplicate even today. They had an ability to uh, diagnose and treat complex brain injuries. We know that they understood the, the solar system. Their calendar was much more advanced than even ours today. 
every time you turned a corner you could walk into a sound chamber or someplace and actually feel the vibrations, feel the natural energy. And maybe this civilization did have tremendous knowledge. Look, here it is in the Temple of Luxor and in many places, the story of the Immaculate Conception. We know we can read it because we can decode it. And what's happening here, this is this is the mother Mutamoya, who is the mother of Amenhotep III. And here she is and she's being, as you might say, sort of embraced by Amon, the double plumed headdress. We'll see lots more of that. It's Amon, you see the beard, which proves he shows he's a god. And that they're, they're, they're sitting on a on a platform being supported over here. You see they're being supported by two goddesses and they are sitting upon a bed here or a bench which itself represents the glyph for heaven. Heck is the bed for heaven which looks exactly like that. So this whole thing is taking place in Scott <laughs> is, is taking place in the celestial realm. And the long passage here in, in, in hieroglyphs. It's, it's him <coughs> asking Jehuti yeah, right. to find him the right one, yeah. the one, uh -huh. and he found him. And this hieroglyph here, Amon is telling the Queen Mother that she is going to give birth to a divine child. Over here in the Valley of the Kings, we were able to explore many of the great complexes and tombs and get a first hand view here in this temple's wall there is coconut trees and people living in homes on stilts this is not in egypt they don't have coconut palms anywhere near egypt going into the tombs was a special experience we could see many of the purely preserved in its full color the symbols the uh, messages the simple but powerful that's the sky we saw everywhere the simple but powerful messages and this is how they actually restored many of these temples. We had a first-hand view from some of the local craftsmen. They glue it in. Everything here was a very, very painstaking process. And we have to be appreciative because hundreds of years ago, these temples were very ruinous. And thousands of people have painstakingly worked to preserve this treasure. So then if you take a train a couple hours south of Luxor down to Aswan, you can experience the full completion of ancient Egypt. This is the Temple of Philae. It's built on an island off the Nile. It was the last surviving true temple of ancient Egypt. I think it lasted to about the year 450 AD. And one final point we can see about the change in history of ancient Egypt. You see, this temple here is very late period, and there's a change in the architecture and the writing, and it's very, very important. What is one of the differences, Ptolemaic from earlier work, is that the columns, the capitals of the columns are much more ornate, because a very different feel to the, to the whole temple. Although the writings and pictures look the same to us casual observers, there was a very, very definite change in the history. It started very powerful, very advanced, and actually somewhat degenerated as it became more ornate over time and became more um, sensual. This is where the civilization that lasted for, say, 10, 11,000 years, maybe much more, ended at this very location. Maybe it is possible that there was a an advanced civilization living far, far in the ancient, distant past. And this civilization had tremendous knowledge, tremendous insight into nature, into human beings, into the, the environment of the Earth and the, the solar system we live in. And we know for certain that there have been tremendous calamities in the planet. There's been super volcanoes, there's been earthquakes. Maybe something did happen after all, and there were some survivors and they found a place to live and that place was Egypt and what we may have here is one of the best preserved examples of what really should be our heritage this is where we came from this is where civilization started and to explore it and to see the roots is a fascinating wonderful experience